Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University, and today I have another guest on the channel. I've got uh, Richard here from Balance, that's at uh, balance.io, to talk about what they're working on. And uh, you want to say hey to everybody, Richard? It's great to have you on the channel. Hey everyone, I'm here from one of two Balance hammocks. <laughs> These are important places for coding and hanging out, um, so uh, if you see the background swaying gently, then that's why. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, this is definitely the uh, first, you know, kind of collaborative video I've done with uh, a guest in the hammock. Oh, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's really good. Yeah, I'm jealous. I gotta, I've got to get me one of those. Um, <laughs> yeah, Richard. So before we kind of jump into, uh, you know, bombarding you with questions, uh, you want to kind of just give us your elevator pitch for, you know, what balance is and what you're working on over there? Yeah, sure. Um, so today, uh, balance is launched. Uh, kind of one product for Ethereum, uh, and that's called Balance Manager, which is a tool that interacts with uh, the most popular uh, wallets, uh, obviously MetaMask, Ledger, and Trezor. Um, so it's a web-based application that connects to those wallets and exposes uh, the tokens and Ethereum that's stored in them. Uh, but crucially, we don't have access to or manage your private keys. Um, it is really a, a way for you to both see the assets in your wallet, uh, send them very easily, and exchange uh, assets as well. Um, today we have an integration with Shapeshift, so uh, which many people do, and we're working on in, uh, several other exchange integrations to allow you to kind of trade one asset to another right from within your Trezor, Ledger, or MetaMask wallet. Um, so uh, yeah, we're working really hard on creating. <clears throat> user interfaces for Ethereum and making uh, making things, I guess, much simpler for regular people to use. Uh, and so moving forwards, uh, we hope to launch uh, a mobile wallet uh, this summer, which I think will have some uh, user experience aspects to it that are slightly different from all of the other wallets out there. Um, and we can talk about the kind of long-term mission for balance as well later on. But yeah, that's really what we do today and what we're going to be doing in the near future. Sure, very cool. So you mentioned a couple of uh, key features in there um, that I like and are important. So can you kind of talk a little bit about uh, managing private keys for people who may not be familiar, who might be getting into the crypto space and are saying, you know, why does that matter? Why do my private keys need to be on my device? And, you know, what value are you providing with balance in that regard? Yeah, so we think that the wallet providers themselves, that is Metamask, Trezor and Ledger, are, are, are excellent at uh, a kind of security and best practices around managing your keys. So when you create a wallet with MetaMask, your private key is stored within the Chrome extension. And MetaMask is a very popular Chrome extension wallet, so that's software. With Trezor and Ledger, these are two teams that are extremely experienced at uh, hardware design, research, and security. And so when you set up a Ledger or a Trezor, you are um, your, your keys again are stored on on the hardware device, and you and you're responsible for managing your backup phrase. Um, and, and so that's why we branded this product Balance Manager because we wanted to kind of uh, make sure you understood that that, that that you you bring a wallet and you can and manage it with our product. And that means that you can in high confidence know that we don't have access to your funds. Um, and, uh, and 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 the, really, you're connecting to our product via the standard application programming interfaces or APIs that each of those wallets provide. So, MetaMask uses something called Web3.js. Trezor has something called Trezor Connect, and Ledger also has a kind of standard JavaScript library uh, to interact. And crucially, what this means is is um, uh, that your that you're able to see things in your wallet that you may not have been able to see before, but you're not trusting us in any way. You're not kind of handing us your private keys. It's just something that you never ever want to do um, as, a, as a new user. So there's a lot more detail we can go into there, but we, this product is really for people who have some familiarity with the Ethereum ecosystem. They've invested in setting up a Chrome-based wallet like MetaMask, or they've actually gone to the trouble of buying a hardware wallet such as Ledger or Trezor. Sure. Very cool. So you've got, you know, this mobile wallet coming out. You've got um, you know, the product that you just mentioned already. Um, so tell me a little bit about your bigger, broader vision for balance and, and kind of what that could be. Yeah, when we were prototyping our product um, in December last year, 
Um, things were our web-based product. Things were getting quite interesting. And then Dai launched, uh, which is from a project called MakerDAO. And what Dai is is it's a coin that maps or, or pegs relatively closely to the dollar, and so you can kind of effectively store dollars that live on Ethereum um, in an Ethereum wallet. And it just kind of hit me over the head that, that essentially, with a few hundred thousand dollars of capital um, and a lot, a little bit of work and, and a few weeks of, of development time, we we, we kind of had a, an open source bank here. Um, the, the the all of the functions that most banks serve of, of storing money, sending money, receiving money, and kind of keeping a ledger were all recreated now in open source code. Uh, and in addition to that. Um, Projects like the Zero X project, which also lives on Ethereum and facilitates exchange from one token to another, is also an enormous function of banking to kind of convert one currency or one form of asset to another. Uh, and then the other major function of a bank is to lend money. So Dharma Protocol, which lives on Ethereum, uh, allows you to create debt contract systems. Um, and then DYDX, which is a protocol for creating kind of margin trading which is, or, or derivatives, you know, you've basically got the kind of major functions of banking, the most profitable businesses that they o- operate, um, running as a set of smart contracts on Ethereum. And I think that's fascinating. I mean, if we were to zoom out on the world, every single bank recreates a ledger, every single bank recreates sending and receiving, every single bank um, kind of offers some form of debt products, Every single bank does exchange, and there's all these engineers rewriting all of this software. And today, that just got collapsed into a set of smart contracts on Ethereum. Obviously, right now, those things are very hard to use in very early stage, but that's always the case with new technology. It's only right. going to get better. So I view this opportunity as you know, we've got open source gold in Bitcoin. We've got open source contracts uh, with Ethereum, and someone is going to build a fully open source bank uh, where it's basically indistinguishable from any bank other than pretty much any piece of the code you can change yourself. Right. Yeah, it's very cool. It's a, it's a great explanation about, you know, kind of the functionalities that exist and how we're uh, disrupting all those and uh, kind of a plan for uh, replacing each of those analogies on the blockchain. That's awesome. So yeah, and it's not sci-fi. It's not promise. It's all shit code today that works. Um, right. and obviously, it's early stage, and could it support millions of users concurrently? Absolutely not. But but you know those now that we know that scalability is a trillion dollar prize, there's so many people working on that that I'm, I'm extremely confident that that will get solved. Um, uh, we're approaching it from the usability side, and my hope is that usability and scalability collide, and we actually get really amazing financial services that are running entirely on open source software. Right. So what do you kind of hope the uh, timelines for these kinds of things are just in, in rough terms? Yeah, I mean, we're integrating with zero X right now and that that's going to work. Uh, Dharma is live on the main net and has already facilitated $50,000 of loans through its first version of its smart contracts. So this isn't vaporware. This is stuff that exists today. And, and um, uh, it's more a question of at what stage would it be competitive with the traditional financial system? And I would say it, it feels like they would start hating this project in kind of two to five years, it feels like. You know, the, 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 I don't see it making a meaningful impact on banks' kind of uh, businesses until it's really too late. Uh, and at that point, the hope is that they decide to launch kind of crypto branches or, or crypto kind of related products and they'll use our software. The, the, the day that a bank forks balance and kind of begins contributing back in the same way that a company forks Linux and starts contributing back, I, I really think that, that, that both Ethereum will have succeeded, um, Bitcoin will have succeeded and, and, and many of those protocols we're integrating with will have succeeded and just as a project will have succeeded because we will have ushered in open source banking. Um, and could be totally wrong about this, but it, it really feels inevitable to me that this is going to happen. Right. That's very cool. So I really appreciate, you know, you explaining how this works and kind of where you see this going. 
Um, so maybe tell me a little bit about your background, which is pretty extensive for people who might be questioning, uh, why you're making these claims and maybe what the perspective that you have to see, uh, the past and maybe be able to peer around corners a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's really, uh, no insight of mine so much as, uh, just kind of bringing together the threads of many other people that I've been following. Sure. Um, I was extremely fortunate to, 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 to have these two kind of pivotal three-month periods uh, in my 20s where one is I spent three months at Stripe, uh, which for if your listeners don't know, is, is one of the fastest growing financial technology companies in the world. And I was there in 2012 when there were around 25 people. And there was a very interesting individual called Patrick Collison, who's the CEO. He's probably one of the most incredible individuals that they see taking in capital and converting it into code. I mean, he is absolutely phenomenal. And Stripe, just for reference now, I believe is approaching 1,500 people. Um, it was an incredible experience to witness a company that's basically growing exponentially uh, and has continued to do so at an incredible pace ever since. So there I kind of learned a lot about execution and about the struggles that you can have with um with, with interacting with traditional financial systems and the enormous amount of work involved, kind of massage those old systems and get them to work smoothly. Um, and then, you know, very fortunate a few years later to stumble across Gavin Wood giving a talk in a small hacker house in San Francisco. I'd already heard Vitalik on a podcast kind of saying something to the effect of, you know, I want to create a decentralized computer for the world. And I just right. thought this guy sounds how I describe as an alien. <laughs> and like, um, uh, Patrick and, and, and Vitalik really are alien-like individuals where they just operate on totally different wavelengths. Uh, and so I offered Gavin, you know, I'm a very junior designer. Could I help out with some user interface work for Ethereum? And I mocked up a, a DAP store, um, a network monitor, a chat client, and a, um, and, and, and a, uh, and a, um, a kind of a tool for interacting with Whisper. And, and so... Um, pretty interesting to be asked to design a kind of DAP browser uh, five years ago. I had absolutely no idea what they were talking about, but did my best to kind of think of a few Ethereum use cases. And I think I pointed to some interesting ones. There was gold coin, um, an insurance contract, and a few other things that were a derivatives contract. And you know, these were the kind of early ideas that were floating around as to what contracts would make sense. And of course, now those are all very common use cases for some of these embryonic projects uh, around um, uh, open source financial tools. Um, and so I left the community simply because I was broke and I was back in Britain and everyone thought I was crazy. Um, and I just, yeah, I went back to normal freelance design and participated in the pre-sale and um, very kindly a member of the foundation reached out and said, we owe you some ETH uh, a couple of years later. And, Awesome. I really changed changed my life. So that in many ways, I feel like I, I kind of owe Ethereum a bit of a debt, and um, uh, we're, we're doing our best to you know, continue the work that um, Vitalik kind of suggested or Gavin suggested, and, and and design and ship interfaces that make Ethereum easier to use for regular people. That's awesome. That's a, that's an awesome story. Very cool. Well, um, Richard. I've really enjoyed um, our chat today. I've really enjoyed kind of hearing about uh, you know your vision for balance and what you guys have got out now and kind of where that's heading and where you see this whole space heading and also you know some some story about your background. Um, before we kind of start wrapping up today, is there anything else that you'd like for the folks at home watching to know? I think many people always ask, "What's the killer DAP?" And it's a question I've been asking for nearly five years because. I, I didn't really have an answer. Um, and for me personally, it's um, the opportunity to offer highly competitive debt markets around the world. And the reason I think debt makes sense is that it works today where you can have a high value transaction like a large loan with low volume, sorry, high, high, with low volume, uh, low velocity of payoff. So you just have this kind of monthly payoff. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that kind of uncensorable global credit scoring and, and, and debt contracts, um, to me, feel like the perfect use case for a blockchain today and one that we can improve on quite quickly. Sure. Um, 
so uh, like I'm sure many people use dApps and find the interactions to be incredibly frustrating if they're treating them as a comparison to a website. And I used to feel the same too. And when I stopped viewing Ethereum as a world computer and start viewing it as a world court, which kind of processes these smart contracts or these agreements, and essentially is this kind of settlement layer on lots of, of code-based agreements. Um, uh, th there's no more stressful agreement than when you enter into a large amount of debt, whether that be a mortgage or a student loan or a business loan or anything. Um, most people are underwater technically, and so uh, any kind of increase in competition in the debt markets should be fascinating. So sure. I, I kind of suggest that as like one theme to leave on. And then another would be... Um, I'm very hostile as a as a person towards most token sale projects because I feel like there's a, an incredible lack of humility about the sheer amount of capital they're raising. Um, there is no reason to raise your A, B, C, D, E, and F round all in one tranche. Um, I think that there's a, a discipline to an organization when you raise in stages. And I saw this at Stripe and I've seen this at other places where – uh, you raise a seed, you ship something, you raise some more, you ship something. You know, th these things um, can be done. There is no reason why everyone has to ICO their entire round at once. It's just pure greed. Uh, and so for your users who are kind of considering investing in dApps or dApps that are selling tokens to exist, you know, if they've never shipped anything before in the real world and they're, they're raising more than 10 million, you can just almost flat out assume that they're not very professional and I would watch out. So I view 99% of tokens as being completely a complete waste of time, and most dApps to be uh, that are funded by them to be run by people who do not understand what this project's all about. So, um, sure. uh, token engineering is a wonderful and growing field, and there are people who have the kind of experience and humility around this that I would listen to. But I would just caution your audience to watch out because most of them are just crap. Sure. Totally. Very cool. Well, Richard, again, uh, I've enjoyed our chat today. If we want to find you know more about uh, Balance and maybe find more about you or follow you online, where can we find those things? Yeah, you can check out the product at balance.io. We've got the links to our code, uh, which is all open source, and um, uh, our Twitter there. Uh, and then I'm pretty active on Twitter because it's how I learn so much about the space and kind of interact with all the people I know. Uh, so I'm Rick Burton, which is R-I-C-B-U-R-T-O-N on Twitter. And please feel free to direct message me anytime or, or hit me up if you've got any questions or ideas or feedback on the product. Um, love to hear from you. Very cool. All right, again, Rick, uh, I've really enjoyed it today. Um, everybody, go go follow him on Twitter. Go follow Balance on Twitter. Go find the project online. Uh, check everything out. Uh, and also, be sure to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this where I'm talking to people who are you know building on top of Ethereum. And until next time, Thanks for watching DAP University. Cheers. Bye-bye.